Hi everyone, this is Dr. J, and in this video I'm going to give you just a brief overview of the three-layer seismic refraction problem. Uh, we've talked about the two-layer problem in another video, and I went through a whole bunch of derivations to show you how to get the expression that relates um, travel time and velocities and the depth of the refractive layer, or the boundary layer, I should say. And now in this problem, we've got uh, a slightly more complicated setup where we have three uh, layers. Um, surface, again, where our source and sensors are. And then a low velocity layer, a intermediate velocity layer, and a higher velocity layer. So three velocity layers. And again, we're just focusing on a single ray. And just to emphasize this again, of course, real seismic waves are uh, radiating out in all directions. Um, the wave front looks more like a, a sphere than a ray, but we're just going to take one point along that ray front and we um, kind of write it as a ray. So this is the ray path from a single point. Um, it refracts into the second layer from the first layer instead of refracting along the boundary. You will get refractions along the boundary. We that That's basically covered by the two-layer problem. Um, but you will also get refractions into this boundary, and if those uh, waves get critically refracted along the boundary between layer 2 and layer 3, then you'll get this secondary refraction effect. And we can actually work out, again, mathematically what that's going to be. Um, so again, we have our total distance x from source to sensor. Uh, we have depths, in this case z1 and z2, for the two layers. Again, the lowest lowest the lowermost layer is generally considered to be infinite in extent, just uh, for mathematical reasons. It doesn't really matter actually how thick it is um, because this wave is not traveling through it. But anyway, we won't worry about down there. Um, and of course, we have the ray path. And now I apologize, my drawing here isn't that great. But again, you have your ray leaving the source. It gets refracted, so theta c is different than theta 1. Uh, and this theta c is the critical angle in this case. So we get critically refracted along the boundary here. The wave ray travels through layer three. This head wave emanates from this point. It again refracts back to the original theta one angle and then arrives at the receiver. So to work out the total travel time for this case, um, if we want to do that, we have some T1, some T2, this is just the time for each one of these individual segments, T4 and T5. So there's five different segments now we need to work out the times for in order to get the total travel time. Of course, as we remember from the two-layer problem, T1 and T5 will be the same, T2 and T4 will be the same, and then T3 will be something different, of course. The velocity of the ray through layer 1 is V1, so both T2 and T5 T1 equals T5 equals, and what did we say this was? It's the distance traveled um, divided by the velocity at which it's traveling. So the distance here is going to be Z1, um, and then it's at this angle theta1, so we adjacent to the theta, so that's the cosine. So it's going to be Z1 over cosine of theta1, and then we need to also divide by the velocity so that cosine theta 1 is going to be cosine theta 1 times z1. Okay, so now we have our layer 2, t2 and t4, the distance traveled in layer 2 divided by the velocity of layer 2. So we have z2 divided by cosine theta c and times v2. So our total travel time so far is going to be twice, 2 times z1 divided by cosine theta 1 v1, and then we have 2 times z2 divided by cosine theta c times v2. And again, the 2 here is coming from the fact that we're traveling both down and up. So we're accounting for both of those in a single term because the terms are the same. Okay, so now we just have this T3 term left. And you can see I've written all these relationships down here at the bottom. Um, this is just to refresh our memory. And T3 here, it's going to be equal to the distance traveled, which we'll calculate in a moment, and then divide that by the velocity of the third layer, which is V3. And again, remember, the critically refracted way ray is traveling at the speed of the lower layer, the faster layer. What's this distance? So we know it's something related to x. It's x minus the x distance divided. x distance traveled in layer 1, x distance traveled in layer 2, and then twice that. 
So we have x minus 2 for layer 1. 2 times, in this case, it's going to be, uh, let's see, we know what z is, and we want to know what this distance is, so that's going to be using the tangent. So it's going to be, um, let's see, tangent theta 1 equals this distance over z1. So it's going to be z1 tangent theta 1 is equal to that x distance. Okay, so then, and you should remember that from layer one, from the two layer problem video. Um, and then now we just have this additional layer that we need to subtract. So we have minus two z2 tan theta c. And then we need to divide all this by v3. So this is now the time it takes to travel along this critically refracted ray path. So we've got our our T1, T5, we've got our T2, T4, and now we've got our T3. Now I'm not gonna go through all the math of simplifying this down. Um, we did that in the two layer problem. I'll spare you the, the, uh, the agony. Uh, and I'll just write down total time. This is in box uh, 5.4. Travel time calculations for a three layer case. So we've done uh, the calculations there. You can see that. We've already verified the total travel time at the top in the top two lines of that box. So take a look at that. And what we'll do now is we'll say that total time is equal to x over v3. And again, this looks similar to what we had last time where it was x over v2. Plus, and then there's this constant term, which in this case is going to be two terms because we have two layers here. So we're going to have 2z2 cosine theta c divided by v2 plus 2z1 cosine theta 1 divided by v. All right, so I also want to point out that that box 5.4 gives you the how to calculate the thicknesses of the refractors, and that's basically using the same type of thing that we talked about for the two-layer problem. And I also want to point out that you're not restricted to just two layers or three layers. You can do this for the general n layer case, and that's given in box 5.5. And this is the type of thing that software does. For shallow geophysics like we're doing, where we have a sledgehammer source, our waves aren't traveling very far, and so having two or maybe three layers is about as much as we're going to get. On the other hand, if you're doing really large seismic refraction surveys where you have very strong uh, shotgun sources or explosive sources, you might be able to get actually several layers. Um, so that multi-layer, n-layer problem will allow you to do that. And again, that's done more in a software case, not really done by hand so much. Okay, so here is the expression now for the total travel time. And again, we see it's a equation of a line where we have a sum, sum, uh, some value times x. So this one over v3 is the slope of that line. And then there's some intercept, which is now related to the top two layers. And so if you were to plot this on a time distance plot, we saw before that the time distance plot for a two layer problem looks something like this, where we have these direct, this is the direct wave arrival here at a distance x less than um, the crossover distance. It's called crossover, crossover distance. <clears throat> And then now we have this third layer. So basically we have these three sets of lines. So basically we have these three sets of lines and these are describing which wave is arriving first. So in this very near field um, area, we have the direct wave arriving first that's traveling through only the uppermost layer. And so it has a velocity of V1 and the slope of this line is one over V1. High, the slowest velocity is the highest slope. In this second section of the, of the observations here, we have a line with a slope of 1 over v2, or waves that are traveling only through the uh, second layer, or I should say waves that are being critically refracted at the boundary between the first and second layer and are refracting back up to the surface as a head wave. Or, um, and then we have in the third layer now, these are waves here, which are traveling, they're getting refracted through the second layer, getting critically refracted along the boundary with the second and third layer. And then they're again, getting refracted back up to the surface. And so this line here 
has the smallest slope because the slope is 1 over v3, and so v3 is actually the largest velocity. So again, this is assuming velocities are increasing as you go down in depth. And this case might be oh, what we would expect to observe, for example, if we have, uh, maybe we have soil sitting on top of um, fractured bedrock, sitting on top of intact bedrock. So that would be like a three-layer problem that might, you might see in shallow geophysics. Another example might be unsaturated soil over top of saturated soil, so the water table being above um, in, the, in the soil region, um, and then bedrock. So that might, again, be another three-layer problem that we would expect to see. And again, this is the distance from the source to the receiving geophone. So there will be geophones all along this distance, um, right? So we have a whole line of geophones, and that's where we get these points, which we'll then use to fit these lines and then estimate those velocities. And again, for the two-layer problem, we can use this first um, intercept to estimate the depth of the first layer. For the three-layer problem, we can then use this second intercept to estimate the depth of the second layer. All right, so with that, I will stop and see you in the next video.